The Snow Goose Part 2 In mid-October, the miracle occurred. Ryder was in his enclosure, feeding his birds. A grey northeast wind was blowing, and the land was sighing beneath the incoming tide. Above the sea and the wind noises, he heard a clear high note. He turned his eyes upward to the evening sky, in time to see first an infinite speck, then a black and white pinioned dream that circled the lighthouse once, and finally a reality that dropped to earth in the pen and came waddling forward importantly to be fed as though she had never been away. It was the snow goose. There was no mistaking her. Tears of joy came to Ryder's eyes. Where had she been? Surely not home to Canada. No, she must have summered in Greenland or Spitsbergen with the pink feet. She had remembered and she had returned. When next Ryder went into Chelmbury for supplies, he left a message with the postmistress, one that must have caused her much bewilderment. He said, Tell Frith, who lives with the fisher folk at Wickaldroth, that the lost princess has returned. Three days later, Frith, taller, still tousled and unkempt, came shyly to the lighthouse to visit La Princesse Perdu. Time passed. On the great marsh it was marked by the height of the tides, the slow march of the seasons, the passage of the birds, and, for Ryder, by the arrival and departure of the snow goose. The world outside boiled and seethed and rumbled with the eruption that was soon to break forth and come close to marking its destruction. But not yet did it touch upon Ryder, or for that matter Frith. They had fallen into a curious natural rhythm even as the child grew older. When the snow goose was at the lighthouse, then she came too, to visit and learn many things from Ryder. They sailed together in his speedy boat that he handled so skilfully. They caught wild flower, they caught wild fowl for the ever increasing colony, and built new pens and enclosures for them. From him she learned the law of every wild bird, from gull to gerfalcon, that flew the marshes. She cooked for him sometimes, and even learned to mix his paints. But when the snow goose returned to its summer home, it was as though some kind of bar was up between them, and she did not come to the lighthouse. One year the bird did not return, and Ryder was heartbroken. All things seemed to have ended for him. He painted furiously through the winter and the next summer, and never once saw the child. But in the fall, the familiar cry once more rang from the sky, and the huge white bird, now at its full growth, dropped from the skies as mysteriously as it had departed. Joyously, Ryder sailed his boat into Chelmbury and left his message with the postmistress. Curiously, it was more than a month after he had left the message before Frith reappeared at the lighthouse and Ryder, with a shock, realised that she was a child no longer. After the year in which the bird had remained away, its periods of absence grew shorter and shorter. It grew so tame that it followed Ryder about and even came into the studio while he was working. In the spring of 1940, the birds migrated early from the Great Marsh. The world was on fire. The whine and roar of the bombers and the thudding explosions frightened them. The first day of May, Frith and Ryder stood shoulder to shoulder on the sea wall and watched the last of the unpinioned pink feet and barnacle geese rise from their sanctuary. She, tall, slender, free as air and hauntingly beautiful, he, dark, grotesque, his massive bearded head raised to the sky, his glowing dark eyes watching the geese form their flight tracery. 
Look, Philippe, Frith said. Ryder followed her eyes. The snow goose had taken flight. Her giant wings spread, but she was flying low and once came quite close to them, so that for a moment the spreading black-tipped white pinions seemed to caress them and then felt the rush of the bird's swift passage. Once, twice, she circled the lighthouse, then dropped to earth again in the enclosure with the pinioned geese and commenced to feed. "'She bent going,' said Frith, with a marvel in her voice. The bird in its close passage seemed to have woven a kind of magic about her. The princess be going to sty. Aye, said Ryder, and his voice was shaken too. She'll stay. She will never go away again. The lost princess is lost no more. This is her home now, of her own free will. The spell the bird had girt about her was broken, and Frith was suddenly conscious of the fact that she was frightened, and the things that frightened her were in Ryder's eyes, the longing and the loneliness and the deep welling unspoken things that lay in and behind them as he turned them upon her. His last words were repeating themselves in her head as though he had said them again. This is her home now, of her own free will. The delicate tendrils of her instincts reached to him and carried to her the message of the things he could not speak because of what he felt himself to be, misshapen and grotesque. And where his voice might have soothed her, her fright grew greater at his silence and the power of the unspoken things between them. The woman in her bade her take flight from something that she was not yet capable of understanding. Frith said, I I must go. Goodbye. I, I, I'll be glad the, that the princess will stay. You'll not be so alone now. She turned and walked swiftly away, and his sadly spoken goodbye, Frith, was only a half-heard ghost of a sound born to her ears above the rustling of the marsh grass. She was far away before she dared turn for a backward glance. He was still standing on the sea wall, a dark speck against the sky. Her fear had stilled now. It had been replaced by something else, a queer sense of loss that made her stand quite still for a moment, so sharp was it. Then, more slowly, she continued on away from the skyward pointing finger to the lighthouse and the man beneath it. It was little more than three months before Frith returned to the lighthouse. May was at its end, and the day too, in a long golden twilight that was giving way to the silver of the moon, already hanging in the eastern sky. She told herself, as her steps took her thither, that she must know whether the snow goose had really stayed, as Ryder said it would. Perhaps it had flown away, after all. But her firm tread on the sea wall was full of eagerness, and sometimes, unconsciously, she found herself hurrying. Frith saw the yellow light of Ryder's lantern down by his little wharf, and she found him there. His sailboat was rocking gently on a flooding tide, and he was loading supplies into her water and food and bottles of brandy, gear and a spare sail. When he turned to the sound of her coming, she saw that he was pale, but that his, that, but that his dark eyes, usually so kind and placid, were glowing with excitement, and he was breathing heavily from his exertions. Sudden alarm seized Frith. The snow goose was forgotten. Philip, ye be going away? Ryder paused in his work to greet her, and there was something in his face, a glow and a look that she had never seen before. Frith, uh, I'm glad you came. Yes, I must go away. A little trip. I will come back. His usually kindly voice was hoarse with what was suppressed inside him. Frith asked, where must she go? Words came tumbling from Ryder now. He must go to Dunkirk, a hundred miles across the channel, 
A British army was trapped there on the sands, awaiting destruction at the hands of the advancing Germans. The port was in flames, the position hopeless. He had heard it in the village when he had gone for supplies. Men were putting out from Chelmbury in answer to the government's call. Every tug and fishing boat or power launch that could propel itself was heading across the channel to haul the men off the beaches to the transports and destroyers that could not reach the shallows, to rescue as many as possible from the Germans' fire. Frith listened and felt her heart dying within her. He was saying that he would sail the channel in his little boat. It could take six men at a time, in a pinch seven. He could make many trips from the beaches to the transports. The girl was young, primitive, inarticulate. She did not understand war, or what had happened in France, or the meaning of the trapped army, but the blood within her told her that here was danger. Philip! Must he go? You'll not come back. Why must it be he? The fever seemed to have gone from Ryder's soul with the fresh rush of words, and he explained it to her in terms that she could understand. He said, Men are huddled on the beaches like hunted birds, Frith, like the wounded and hunted birds we used to find and bring to sanctuary. Over them fly the steel peregrines, hawks and gerfalcons, and they have no shelter from these iron birds of prey. They are lost and storm-driven and harried, like the Princess Perdu you found and brought to me out of the marshes many years ago, and we healed her. They need help, my dear, as our wild creatures have needed help, and that is why I must go. It is something that I can do. Yes, I can. For once, for once I can be a man and play my part. Frith stared at Ryder. He had changed so. For the first time she saw that he was no longer ugly or misshapen or grotesque, but very beautiful. Things were turmoiling in her own soul, crying to be said, and she did not know how to say them. I'll come with thee, Philip. Ryder shook his head. Your place in the boat would cause a soldier to be left behind, and another, and another. I must go alone. He donned rubber coat and boots and took to his boat. He waved and called back, Goodbye! Will you look after the birds until I return, Frith? Frith's hand came up, but only half to wave too. Gold speed you, she said, but gave it the Saxon turn. I will take care of the birds. Gold speed, Philip. It was night now, bright with moon fragment and stars and northern glow. Frith stood on the sea wall and watched the sail gliding down the swollen estuary. Suddenly, from the darkness behind her, there came a rush of wings, and something swept past her into the air. In the night light, she saw the flash of white wings, black-tipped, and the thrust-forward head of the snow goose. It rose and cruised over the lighthouse once, and then headed down the winding creek where Ryder's sail was slanting in the gaining breeze, and flew above him in slow, wide circles. White sail and white bird were visible for a long time. Watch o'er him, watch o'er him, Frith whispered. When they were both out of sight at last, she turned and walked slowly with bent head back to the empty lighthouse.